this tendency as human beings and uh, to forget that and to forget and, and to keep thinking that we're not good enough. And guess what? We're not. We need to accept that fact. Uh, but uh, it is a definitely a great message. I'm going to pray for us to start, uh, start off our service today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house. Lord, we just thank you for just us having a place, Father, We thank to, to gather. Lord, we thank you for air conditioning. We thank you for the comfortable seats. We thank you for all these wonderful blessings that we so often take for granted. And we just ask that you do move, on, move in on us, just pour your spirit in, into us, Father, as we do look into your word, as we continue our road trip through the Bible. Father, just help us to, to truly appreciate the circumstances that the Israelites were in and see how well they compare to our lives today. We just want to take your, world, you take your word and, and make it alive for this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all, oh, please sit down. You're making me nervous. Okay. <laughs> oh, thanks, Kelly. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So I, I am... Uh, to be honest with you, I am nervous. I, I do get nervous every time we do this. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the bathroom this morning. I tend to overshare things. <laughs> so one thing that helps me is this weird old tradition that I have. So if you do not mind, hold up your Bible. Kelly's going to put the words up for us here on this next slide and repeat after me, okay? This is my Bible. Bible. Okay, with feeling. This is my Bible. This is my I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am about to hear a message from this infallible, incorruptible word of God. Okay, my, my, we're not done. My mind will be attentive. <laughs> my heart will be receptive. And I'm going to shout glory because my life will never be the same. Amen. There we go. I appreciate that. That is something that one of my first pastors taught taught us to do. Um, he did it every time that he would preach, and it was just that reminder that when when we get up here and we are sharing something from the Word of God, it is actually from the Word of God. If for some reason uh, you ever go attend a church service or you have someone that is teaching or preaching and they never bring up the Bible or they maybe say things that are slightly Christianese, like it sounds like it might be in the Bible, but it can't actually, they can't actually say where it's from, that's a red flag. And so we do that, or I do that, as a reminder that this is the Word of God. We have a responsibility when we do get up to preach, when we do get up to share. We, it, it is something we need to take seriously. And the Bible actually says that you, as the hearers, you also have a responsibility. And what is that responsibility? Does anybody know? You need to tell me. Other than just being receptive and being and paying attention. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. It is your job to call me out, to call whoever's speaking out. If we say something that is does not line up with what's in the Bible, that is contrary to what the Word of God says, it is your job to call somebody out. It may be an awkward conversation, but it is a necessary conversation. So please do take that responsibility to heart. All right, so today, uh, Corey has trusted me uh, greatly to present to you the midsection of Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy, I am covering chapters 4 through 26. We're going to cover a lot of, a lot of stuff um, rather quickly uh, because I don't want to go into too much detail because we will get bogged down. And if you've been in one of my Wednesday night classes, you'll know what I'm talking about where we've gone through, you know, we spent an hour and a half on two verses. We're not going to be doing that just because we're covering so much ground but there are a few things I want to highlight. I want to highlight something called that, that is referred to as the Shema, real quick. Shema is S-H-E-M-A. It is these two verses that are up on your screen right now. It's Deuteronomy 6, uh, verses 4 and 5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Does that sound familiar to anyone that's familiar with the New Testament? Who else said that? Jesus, that's right. That is the greatest commandment. The Shema is the Jewish, or what would be the Jewish equivalent to a daily prayer, like what a lot of, uh, a lot of Catholics and Protestants, too, do the Lord's Prayer. We remind us daily to go through that. And this is something that, that a lot of Jews do as well. Uh, and so we're, gonna be, we're not going to be going in. I just want to kind of cover these things just because that's something that really, that really sticks out in these, in these passages because that is such a core to the Jewish and Israelite faith. Uh, so much to the fact that Jesus himself said, this is the greatest commandment. Um, 
So, but we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be carrying on. We're gonna be going through a lot of a lot of uh, different stuff today. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I appreciate the trust that Corey has placed in me. I appreciate y'all's patience and y'all's trust that y'all placed in me as well. Uh, I tend to be a little rough around the edges sometimes. Um, I may sound harsh, um, as as my youngest son will tell you, crying don't fix things in my house. Um, but we, we, we appreciate honesty. And so I want to be honest with you. So, so if I do come off as harsh or as cold or callous, please know I'm just trying to get a point across. And it is obviously meant in love and for the betterment. Um, as we learned last week, the book itself, Deuteronomy, is, comes from a Greek word meaning second law or the second stating of the law. Uh, and this is because of the, ju- the uh, generation that actually left Egypt. They disqualified themselves from actually getting all the way to the promised land. Uh, because they, they, they decided to do their own thing. Um, and we're going to get into that in here just a little bit. But this is, the book itself is Moses educating that next generation that is going to go into the promised land on their history, on what their parents went through or their grandparents went through. And so that they understood going forward, this is what God has done. So don't get, don't be surprised when God does crazy things to take care of you going forward. Okay, so. Uh, now, on the flip side of that, he is he does kind of get a little repetitive on stuff. And so we're going to get into we're going to get into that. And he is talking to them very much the way a parent talks to their child. And like I said, crying, don't fix things at our house. Sometimes those talks can be a little bit serious. And so so uh, so Moses is going to get a little bit repetitive, but he's really doing that just because he understands their attention span. We're also going to get into, and because I'm a history nerd, we're going to get into a little bit about ancient Babylon. I hope you're excited about that. Yay! <laughs> I'm getting much better at detecting sarcasm. Uh, and then we're also going to be talking about becoming and being children of God and what does that mean. And, and the, the songs that, that Steve prepared for us this week really line up with a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate Steve stepping up and, and, and Tom stepping up and helping out with, uh, with worship while Riken's out. I want to get in real quick. Let's go ahead and, and, and move on, uh, Kelly. So what we're, what we're going to do is, because I talk about Moses being repetitive, and why is he being repetitive? Well, because, like I said, he understands their, their attention span. And if you think that I'm joking about that, I want to, I want to go through this real quick. Deuteronomy 4.1. Hear, O Israel, the, status and or, or the statutes and ordinances I am teaching you to follow, so that you may live and may enter and take possession of the land th- that the Lord your that the Lord your God the God of your fathers is giving you. Okay, next slide, five one. Then Moses summoned all of Israel and said, "Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I declare in your in your hearing this day. Learn them and observe them carefully." Six three. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe them, so that you may prosper and multiply greatly in the land f- flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. Next. Seven. So keep the commandments and statutes and ordinances that I am giving you to follow this day. Next. You must carefully follow the commandments that I am giving you today so that you may live and multiply and enter and possess the land the Lord swore to give your fathers. Okay. That was what, five times? Five times that basically Moses is saying the same thing, and that's why I say sometimes Moses is taking on this dad role. And he is saying to, to the people of Israel, okay, I need you to pay attention. I'm going to tell you something that's very important. Okay? No, 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 no. Something shiny, something shiny. Over here. I'm going to say it. And he says it over and over and over and over and over again. Why does he do that? Is it because he likes saying it again? Parents? Is it because you like repeating yourself? No. It's because he understands that people have short attention spans. And so he is saying it over and over and over again. And, and, it, and it really seems like he is kind of drilling this in. But let's, let's go to the next slide, Kelly. What, what is he always having to, also having to point out? He says, remember this. And this is in Deuteronomy 9, 7. And guys, we're going quick. I know it seems like I'm going super fast, but it, I really do. I planned this message and I organized these notes because we thought the air conditioner wasn't going to be working today. And so this is this is rather going this is going to be rather rather short and rather to the point, but but uh, so as I'm as I'm pacing, I promise I'm going to take some breaths in between here. But in Deuteronomy nine, uh, verse seven, he says, "Remember this, and never forget how you provoked the Lord your God in the wilderness 
from the, from the day you left the land of Egypt until you've reached this place, you have been rebelling against the Lord. Okay, who can tell me what that's about? What, what, was, what was something they did? Which, by the way, let, let, let's set up the scene for you real quick. Moses has now gone up to Mount Sinai, and he's up there for 40 days. And in, within the time of 40 days, the people have completely lost their minds. Okay? They have lost their minds, and they start getting, they start getting Aaron, or A.A. Ron. They start getting Aaron all worked up, and they finally get him to agree. I want you to make us, a, make us an idol for a God that we can worship, because we assume that Moses is dead. <laughs> 40 days. Guys, they came out of how many generations? Like 400 years in Egypt? And God split oceans and drowned armies. And, and he's getting ready to, 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 to dam a river in, a, in an impossible way. Like all of these crazy things that, that God has done for them to take care of them. And their 40 days, they're off to wanting a new God. Like how, how crazy is that? But we do this. Like we, we forget what it is that God has done. Like I, I've always thought... Like keeping a journal or a diary was, I, this is, and I, I know I'm going to offend someone when I say this, but stick with me. I've always thought that keeping a journal was the dorkiest thing ever. Like, it's just, come on, seriously, who does this? Why is it, why do you feel like your thoughts are so important that they need to be documented? And it just seems so weird. Like, that, that was my idea. That was, yeah, I didn't understand. And I see a couple people getting like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> and I get that. But here's where I truly have learned as I've matured and as I, have, as I have gotten older, and be honest, and I've figured out a few things, the value of a journal, the value of knowing your own personal history. Because when you, especially a prayer journal, or you, you, when you, you buy the Bible with, with the, with the wide, extra wide margins, there's so much value in that remembering what God has brought, not just his whole people through, like a general population through, but brought you through personally. Because we forget. We forget the turmoil. We forget pain very easily. We remember that things were uncomfortable, but we forget how painful they can be. We forget how hard it is, how scared you are in a moment. I can't tell you how many times as a parent that uh, one of my kids has been sick, and you're just sitting, you're, you're staying up with them. I, I, um, uh, Rowan, our youngest, was sick just last week. And all night long, I'm sitting up on the couch because I'm holding him up because he's got a stomach bug. And I am so terrified that he's going to throw up and he's going he's gonna to get sick and he's going to you know, choke or just something awful. And so all night long, I'm, I'm sitting there and holding him. And any time like, he starts snoring, I'm like freaking out. <laughs> now, two days later, when I had the stomach bug... I had completely forgotten about everything with him. But that night was a long night. And I don't, I don't keep a journal. I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not good at it. I'm not organized as well as I should be. Uh, but that is one of those things where I can tell you I spent all that night praying. The, uh, oh gosh, was it last year or the year before last? I think it was last year my wife got COVID. That was a terrifying time. And I, I am... I am, a met, I am a first responder. Like, I am certified and trained on how to do all this crazy stuff that just goes right out the window whenever something hits that close to home. But, and, but like, I was every 45 minutes, I'm like, no, you have to sit up. I have to check your O2 levels <laughs> for three days. Now, granted, and then, and then eventually, you know, things got better and things got easier, but I was terrified. It was one of those times, and it's the only time in my life where I can honestly say that I felt bad for not talking to people because I was too busy talking to God. And I completely, everybody's like texting me for updates, how's she doing, how's she doing, how's she doing? And I'm like, uh, I, 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 I'll get back to you tomorrow. I don't, I don't, I don't have time for this. I, I, you know, because, but we forget, like in those moments, it's God that's carrying us through. And it's God that's, that's literally keeping us breathing. Like I, that's that when eventually your prayer gets down to just keep them breathing, just keep them breathing. And, and God hears those prayers and God will, God will hold you on the, hold you in the same way that when you're sitting there shaking and you're struggling and you, and you can get off this slide. It's going to make me laugh in a minute, but 
when you're when you're in that moment and it is chaotic and it is crazy and you are looking at an army of Egyptians coming at you in their case, or you are looking at an army of bill collectors or an army of judgmental co-workers, you know, whatever it is, God is ready to hold on to you. And we need to mark these things down. You know, the, the, one of the problems with social media is that we get uh, the best parts of everyone's life. Like if you, if I have friends that I swear do nothing but vacation, like, I don't understand, like, how do you, I, you're, you're on the beach seven days a week. I don't, I don't how do you afford this? I don't, I don't understand it. Because they're not documenting the, especially if they have small kids, they're not documenting the ride to the beach. Um, <laughs> we spent three years saving up, and we went to Disney a few years ago, or a couple years ago. And it was last summer. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I should write this stuff down. <laughs> but, so, but we made the decision to fly. And we made that decision because I was convinced that a 14-hour car ride is going to ruin any positive memory we had <laughs> coming back from Disney. Well, we spent a week out there, and, and it would have been gone. As soon as, as soon as they realized there's no Bucky's in Mississippi, then, then that road trip would have been ruined. Okay? But... We, so we need to, we forget when people are posting just positives and we're only sharing the positives, we forget about the struggles that we deal with. We, stru we forget about the times that God has brought us through to get us to this land of milk and honey. When we are, when we are having our moments of just calm and peace where we can just sit there and just thank God for this day, we forget sometimes the struggle that it took to get us here. And what the Israelites did in 40 days, they had completely forgotten about generations and generations of folks that were lost in the desert, or that, that were not lost in the desert, they were enslaved in Egypt. And what God had to do, because you got to remember, it wasn't just parting the Red Sea. Like, do you remember the plagues? <laughs> the plagues themselves, and he protected the Israelites from these plagues. Every single thing that God did, and I don't, I don't mean to say he went over the top, but he made it evident that it was him. And he made this so plain and clear to them, and in 40 days they forgot all of it. And so, yeah, when they, when they, had, when they had Aaron to make that golden calf, and Moses comes down, and he's like, are you kidding me? And Moses is carrying down the tablets with the Ten Commandments on it. Like, he has had the youth camp of a lifetime up there. And, he, and, and God has written, like, physically written things down for him. And he's like, this is, you people are nuts. And he smashes them on the ground. Like, everything goes completely out the window. Because they have forgotten, because they don't realize what it is that they are still, they're still living under the watch of this God who created them, of this God that is carrying them through those every, of those, every one of those situations. Now, thankfully, as, you'll, as we continue on, thankfully God gives us another chance. And in Deuteronomy 10.1, he says, At that time, the Lord said to me, Chisel out two stone tablets like the originals, Come, come, to me, come up to me on the mountain and make an ark of wood, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. And <laughs> he put that in there. <laughs> and you will place them in the ark. So even this, so even when, when, when everybody's gone completely uh, crazy and, they've, and they have completely abandoned this God that has brought them thus far, and he, they, have, they have said, no, we're going we're gonna to do something else. We need something that we can tangibly see so that we can, so that we can focus and that, we, so that we, we, can, we just need to do it our way. That's the solution. Because when things get chaotic, we think we've got the solution. I'm a fixer. I have made, my, I've made an IT career in the last 20 years nearly of fixing computer problems. I understand. It is in my nature to fix things. But I have, I have had to be reminded many times throughout my life, I can't fix everything. I can't cure COVID. I can't stop a stomach bug. I can't, uh, I can't you know, magic wand away a friend's depression. 
These are things that I can't fix. These are things that I have to be reminded that God has reminded me throughout my life. These are on his plate. And, and, but it is human nature. And this is why we, when we talk about, and we talk about this a lot on Wednesday night, the Bible has some super shady people in it. Incredibly, I mean, class A screw-ups. And that's one of the reasons why we know the Bible is real, because that would have gotten a little bit sugar-coated. Okay, if you want to talk about some of the scandals back in Genesis... It was rough. People were, were people were rough, um, and so. But but this is this is the reality of it. We forget these things. We we get distracted. We start setting aside things, and we forget that God has that God is the one who's in control. And so sometimes He has to sit us down and start us back over. These are the tablets that you broke, by the way. And so, but we're going to start over. We're going to start fresh. Okay, and like a loving parent says, God says, okay, we're going to go through this one more time. And I'm really hoping you're going to get it. But if not, we'll go through it again, but let's try it this time, okay? And so we continue on. In Deuteronomy 10, verses uh, 12 and 13. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways? to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. That's a shout out back to the Shema. And keep the commandments and statutes that the Lord, that the Lord, or, uh, of the Lord that I am giving you, that I'm giving to you for your own good. Okay? The stove is hot. How, how many times? Now, thankfully, my, both my boys love to cook. And I really appreciate that because that means we got past the don't touch the burner part real fast. <laughs> they want to be up there. They were up there. They are exposed to it enough. Um, they've each got, it's not a permanent scar, but they've each gotten burns at some points on the tips of their fingers because they weren't paying attention to what they were doing. So we got, we got past that really quickly. But God is, God is saying this, look, I'm going to talk to you this. We're going to go through this one more time. I just need you to know this is for your own good. Okay, please listen to me. I'm not trying to ruin your fun. I'm not trying to, to, to steal your joy. I have something better for you in mind. If you will just please quit trying to do your own thing when I've outlined a path for you. Okay, in Deuteronomy 11, eight, verses 8 and 9, he says, you, you shall therefore keep every commandment that I am giving you today so that you may have strength to go in and possess the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you may live long in this land, the Lord swore to your fathers to give them and to their descendants, a land flowing of milk and honey. That's the promise. Like, this is a promise that was given before, this is back in Genesis. Remember, these, these, these were going to be the descendants of Abraham. Like, you were going, now it's also in Genesis, he says, your, your children are, go, now your descendants are going to spend 400 years in bondage. So if you ever wonder why they had to be in Egypt for 400 years, well, because that was part of the prophecy, that was part of the deal. But this was the promise. This is the, this is the end result. Now, it has taken so long to get there. And I think we've talked about this. I know the youth were talking about this on Wednesday night. Uh, youth, what happens when we decide to take God's will into our own hands? Anybody remember the talk from Jake, Jake gave you all? Oh, I've got some confused teenagers. This is great. Okay, who's Ish, remember Ishmael, Isaac, that whole, that whole situation? Okay, the... The, sometimes we take things into our hands, into our own hands, and they spin up, and they spin pretty well out of control, and we have historical problems. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Jake, I know you're in the hallway, so we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, but he is trying, so Moses is trying to drive home this parent-talk relationship, and in Deuteronomy 11, 26 and 28, or through 28, it says, See, today I am setting before you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I give you today, but a curse if you disobey the commandments of the Lord your God and turn aside from a path that I command you today and following other gods which you have not known. This is where we talk about being harsh and being very honest, okay? He's saying, look, it's very simple. You either make a good choice and good things happen, or you continue to make bad choices and bad things happen. Which leads me to my favorite quote by John Wayne. Life is hard. It's even harder when you're stupid. 
And this is one of those things. This is why with, with, with my kids, we, when we, you know, it's not just I love you, bye. It's make good choices, I love you. Okay? I need you to make good choices. I need you to understand that making good choices leads to good consequences. Making bad choices leads to bad consequences. It's not a tricky thing. And yet our own human nature uh, is, is really fights against us on this. Like we are so convinced that our brains are so powerful and that we are so smart and we've got it all figured out. And the first person that we convince of that is always ourselves. And then we try our best to convince everyone else. And what God is saying is that even though you keep touching that hot stove, even though you keep trying to figure it out on your own, even though you keep trying to decide how this world works because you think you can live your truth, I'm still here. I still have a plan. I still know what's really going on. And I will still welcome you back. So we can continue on. Now, okay, chapters 12 through 26. This is where I'm, I don't want to get bogged down too much verse for verse, okay? But 12 through 26 is a repetition, is a, re, is a rehash and a relearning of the, command, the Ten Commandments and the other covenant laws that we learned about in, ex, or in, uh, yeah, in Exodus and Leviticus. Um, and I want to get in. I don't want to talk about them all individually because we, we, y'all will kill me. Um, and I'm already starting to get some dirty looks from the back row. So, uh, but I do want to talk about a couple of things. So I, for the last nine years, I've worked at a law firm. Uh, a lot of people make assumptions that, that I suddenly know things about laws. Um, for the four years previously, I worked at Gold's Gym. And as you can tell, I loved it. It was a great environment, but it didn't always stick. Okay. Uh, I do want to talk about, too, though, the covenant law. And this is all we're going to get into it. Uh, there is a perception that the covenant law itself is plagiarized. You know what I'm talking about. Has anybody ever heard of the Code of Amurabi? Okay. Amurabi was a, um, Amurabi was a Babylonian king uh, around the, the 18th century BC, so this is roughly 500 years before Moses. Uh, he wrote a, a um, codice of laws that was about uh, roughly about 300 laws and it had a lot of the same terminology, a lot of the same phrases that we see in the covenant law, such as eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. A lot of people think and will try to argue that Moses simply just copied off his, off, off his homework. Okay. This is an established, uh, and the dating on all of this stuff, and the dating with, with the Code of Hammurabi and all of this is uh, pretty well established. It did actually uh, predate the, the Ten Commandments and the covenant law being written down by about 500 years. Now, does that mean it's plagiarized? No. What that means is that God took and expanded upon a law that was already, and, a, and, and customs that were already familiar with the people in the Near East, uh, and, he, and he basically said, we're going to make it a little bit different. And so a lot of those differences, and they're, they're very similar, a lot of the stuff is, is extremely similar, but what the main differences are, are in the consequences. So it, in both the Code of Hammurabi and the, and the Covenant Law, it is illegal or it is unlawful to strike a slave and, say, damage their eye, knock a tooth out, things like that. Even though they're considered property, it's not okay. Both laws, both laws will say that that, is, that that is wrong. However, God takes it a little bit further in the fact of, in the Code of Hammurabi, there is a, um, there's this concept of talion, and talion not Italian, but talion. I should have put this one up there. Uh, it's, a me it's a term meaning measure for measure. If you do this, this is the consequence. So it's like, how do we balance that out? Uh, the talion or the measurement, or the consequence for, say, striking a slave and knocking out a tooth, according to the H Code of Hammurabi, is you have to pay them a third of a mina of gold. That comes out to roughly $13,000 today. That's a fun Google search. If you ever want to try to find out what that, what that, uh, those ancient equivalents are, um, just, just ask me. I wrote it all down. Um, so you have to pay a slave. If you knock out, if you go and knock out somebody's tooth, you have to pay them $13,000, according to the Code of Hammurabi. According to covenant law, if you knock out a slave's tooth, then they are no longer a slave. They are to be set free, and you're supposed to compensate them to start them off on their life. Okay, so... A lot of the, a lot, there's a lot of coincidences, there's a lot, I want to say coincidences, there's a lot of parallels and a lot of similarities between the Code of Hammurabi and the Covenant Law, but where they are, dip, where they differ greatly and where, this is how you know God's working through this situation, is the consequences. 
their what is the outcome of this? Where and, and why do y'all think that why do y'all think that we have more strict consequences in the covenant law than they did in the Code of Hammurabi? Hmm? Okay. So the Code of Hammurabi, like I said, this was this was well known for 500 years before Moses wrote down the tablets or smashed the tablets. Um, and so this was something that would have been known, and, and, and everyone out to the Near East, uh, they would have known this, these are customs and cultures, the things that we just assume are okay. Like this, these are the cultural standards of the day. What God did was he took, he took a lot of those, added in more, uh, but he took a lot of those codes and standards and, and, and cultural expectations and elevated them. And he said, no, 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 yeah, you're right. All these things that even these people know are wrong, they're still wrong for you, but you're going to be a whole lot more adherent to it. You're going to actually, there's, there's going to be some teeth in these laws for you. You're, there's going to be higher consequences. There, you're going you're gonna to know it, and guess what? The world's going to see it. So what he did was he took, the, he took, he took his laws that he, that he had already, in these, in these ideas and these concepts that he had already baked into us from creation. Is it, so, so let me ask this then, because this is, this is a, an argument that I have with an, with a, with an atheist friend. Um, is it wrong to murder somebody? Why? No, 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 no. I'm talking like to my atheist friend that doesn't believe in God. Why is it wrong? It's illegal. Okay. Why is it illegal? Somebody wrote the laws. Okay. Let's say we're on a desert island, and it's just me and you. That's it. Is it? Is it wrong to murder somebody? Yes. It is wrong to murder somebody. It doesn't matter. The <laughs> Say it again. Well, this one might be. Um, <laughs> but in particular, we'll get down to the point where they will try to use the argument of because they're, they're so hard against the idea that, that we have been created and designed to have a moral compass by God that uh, they will argue that because the government, it's illegal. Because the, the entire group of people have decided, they all agree this is wrong. Well, what if there's only two people? Well, is it still wrong? Uh, yeah. Well, how come? There's no government. There's no majority. If half the people on the island think it's okay to murder the other half. See, God instilled these things into us from creation. We know that certain things are wrong. We know that by there is... As much as, and, and as successful as some people have been at, at convincing others that life doesn't have value, we know for a fact life has value. We honor life, we celebrate life, we treasure life. And it's sometimes lost on people because they have bought in and they have convinced themselves that life, that one life has more value than another or another life doesn't have any value at all. But it's built into us. The reason why I believe Amurabi here 500 years before these things were actually codified was able to write the same things down is because I feel like this was already built into his coding. He, believe it or not, was created in the image of God just like everyone else. And so there were, there were certain things, there were certain ethics and morals that were coded into him. We know that life has value. It's not okay to knock out someone's teeth. Okay? It's also not okay to really think about knocking someone's teeth out. Okay, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to anybody going to work and you see that one coworker and say, "I'm not going to do it," but I'm thinking about it. That's still not okay, and we're that's a whole other discussion. But what God did when He wrote down the covenant law was He put some teeth behind it, and He said, "Look, these are the morals and these are the guidelines. These are the rules I really want you to play by." And here's why I'm definitely going to enforce it. I'm definitely going to make sure you understand that these are important to me. Okay? So, we've talked about here, as, as, as I said in the beginning, we were going to talk about, does anybody remember the three things we were going to cover? Parenting, ancient Babylon, we got that one, being children of God. What is the one theme through all of Deuteronomy, with all the repetition, with all of the, the circling back, with all of the uh, um, reinforcements of seems like the same thing over and over and over and over and over again? What, what was something that was consistent? Listen to God. I'm asking you, please, these are the commandments that I'm giving you. They are for your own good. In the same way that a parent says to their children, 
the stove is hot. This is for your own good. Please know that I'm not trying to steal your joy. I've got something great in mind for you. I know what all the possibilities are. You've just got to stick with the plan, and, I'm, and I'm, I will be as patient as I have to be, but I need you to step up and make good choices. So that is when I talk about being God's children. No matter what, no matter how long this journey is, no matter how many turns we take, no matter how many times we touch the stove, how much too many times we get distracted by something shiny, by some lifestyle that, that we know is not something God wants us to do, but man, look at it. doesn't matter. However many times that we turn away from God, He is still there waiting for us. And one thing that I, that I, I want to make sure that I, that I don't completely step out on, um, go ahead. In Deuteronomy 18, uh, in Deuteronomy 18, I believe it's verses 15 through 18, I want to read this to you real quick. It says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, this is Moses talking to the people of Israel, from among your brothers. You must listen to him. This is what you have asked for when, the Lord, when you asked the Lord at Horeb on the, day that, on the day that you assembled, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God or see his great fire anymore for, <laughs> so, that, so that we will not die. The Lord said to you, uh, the Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up for them a prophet. Oh, I, oops, I copied that one wrong. Okay. What, what we have here in back and way back in the middle of Deuteronomy in, in, in chapter 18 is a uh, messianic prophecy. All the way back. If you go back to Genesis, there's a ton of them. And you go into Exodus and all of this. And Moses was set up as really this archetype for Jesus. What, what God has done, and he's telling them now in the middle of this really long speech, is I have a better plan for you. Okay, It's going to take 1,300 years for that and other prophet like Moses to stand up for, to be able, for, for when he comes. Okay, So we don't get to control the timing. But God never gives up on us. He never leaves us out there shivering in the cold alone. We have got to remember, and like I said, as, as dorky as it may sound, keeping a journal and remembering what God has brought us through corporately as a people and individually at, at just by ourselves. We've got to remember these things because this is how we know. This is what our hope is built upon. This is how we know that God is moving and God is going to continue to keep moving. So I'm going to ask Steve to come up. If you guys can come up here, and we're going to get ready to do our last song and get ready to dismiss here uh, in just a minute. We're going to have announcements afterward. Uh, but I just want to, if you don't mind with me, uh, just bear with me for just a minute here. As the music plays, and if you, if you, if you will, please bow, bow your heads, close your eyes. So I have a couple of questions, and, I, don't, and I, want, I want everyone to feel like they can be honest here. So please, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you have been in a situation where you know that you have been, or, or you're in a situation now where you know for a fact that you have been closer to God than you are today, and the things that, that, that you're facing today seem like they're just ready to crash in on you like waves in a storm, you have an opportunity. You can take today, you can make this day that day that you turn back to God, that you turn back and closer to God. Maybe you don't feel like you've turned completely away from God, and that's fine. But maybe today is a day that we start to focus in. We start to get back into the practices that we were doing when we were feeling closer to God. So I want to pray for you guys real quick. If you don't mind, if you feel like that's you today, just raise a hand. Eyes are closed. Heads are down. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that honesty. It's not easy. It's not easy. But all of us, and, and all the way back thousands of years, we have to remember this is human nature. It's what, it's what we do. But thankfully, we have a God that is there to welcome us back. I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time in your house. We thank you for the many opportunities and the chances that you give us. Father, please help, help us to make today the day that we start getting our lives retuned, redirected. Help us to focus, Father, don't, not to get so easily distracted, but just to focus in on what it is that you are wanting us to do. Lord, we, we know and we acknowledge that we don't, we don't get it. We don't see it all. We don't know it all, Lord, we, but we, are, we know that you do and that you are our anchor through these storms. Just help us today to be focused fully on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.